So uh, would people please take their seats and we'll get this session started. So I'm Joel Premack. I'm the chair of the Forum on Physics and Society. And we have uh, a number of the leadership of the Forum on Physics and Society here. Uh, the past chair, Bev Hartline, the secretary treasurer, Tony Feinberg, uh, Bill Coldglazer, who's going to be my successor as chair, so he's chair-elect, and uh, Stuart Prager, who's the vice chair, who's the next in the presidential line, and several members also of the Forum on Physics and Society Executive Committee. We're here uh, for two purposes today. The first is to uh, have a lecture by Shirley Jackson in response to her receiving the Joseph A. Burton Forum Award. And then the second is that we're going to have, after Shirley's talk and the question and answer, uh, a business meeting of the Forum on Physics and Society. So Shirley Jackson is this year's recipient of the Forum Award. And this is the APS slide that uh, announces the award. Unfortunately, it didn't get scaled quite to the right size, but all the crucial information is there. For distinguished application of her knowledge of physics to public service and increasing diversity in physics as chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and as president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and for service on many government, charitable, and corporate boards and committees. So please welcome Shirley Jackson and uh, thank you, Shirley, for all of the things that you've done and for this talk that you're about to give us. Physics, the river that runs through all. Good morning. And thank you all for uh, coming out to hear me this morning. So this will be a somewhat uh, autobiographical at the beginning but I think you'll understand why. And needless to say, I'm delighted to uh, be here for this American Physical Society April meeting and to accept the award from the Joseph A. Burton Forum. Now, it is indeed at the interface of physics and society that, that I have, in fact, built most of my career, but I'm not unique in this. And before we end today, I will offer my theory of why physics as a discipline is such an excellent training for the resolution of complex problems in many different domains, including the societal and political. But let me tell you a little bit about the river that runs through my career in theoretical physics and at the nexus of physics and society. Now, one could say that I became aware of the powerful linkage of science, including physics with society, because of the major social upheavals that occurred as I was growing up in Washington, DC. As a child, I had excellent parents who encouraged my early interests in science and math. My mother, a social worker, loved literature, taught us all to read before kindergarten. My father was not a high school graduate, worked at the Postal Service, but was mathematically and mechanically gifted. He had served in World War II in a segregated army unit, and during the Normandy invasion, the rudders of the amphibious vehicles bringing the supplies and troops to shore kept breaking, and he improvised a repair with a special splice he created on the spot for which he received a bronze star, and his method was taught throughout France. But as a child, I was fortunate in the convergence of two events that allowed me to receive an excellent education and that actually had a lot to do with where the nation went with respect to science. The first was the desegregation of the Washington, D.C. public schools in 1955, after the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision. The second event occurred two years later, when, of course, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, which, as you know, occasioned fear among political leaders and policymakers that we might be losing the Cold War, which culminated with man's missions to the moon. Now, Sputnik 1 also spurred a new emphasis on math and science in the public schools, and I benefited from that. I was tested in the sixth grade, ended up in an accelerated honors academic program in the seventh grade, 
I finished high school with a number of advanced college level subjects. This was before the advent of formal AP courses. And as valedictorian of my high school class, I was admitted to MIT, where I was one of the first two African American women uh, at MIT uh, to graduate anyway. Now, my awareness of the science and society linkage was sharpened uh, when I was first thinking of majoring in physics, when a distinguished professor advised me that colored girls should learn a trade. Now, this hurt my feelings, but I knew I had to make a choice, either to give in to that and, or to pursue excellence. And so I chose to make physics my trade. Now, one could say that beyond awareness, I became involved at the interface of science and society when I, in fact, became uh, involved with recruiting more African-American students to MIT when I was a grad student following the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in April of 1968, when I was a senior uh, deciding where to attend grad school. Now Penn, uh, the physics department there, had admitted me and invited me to visit. I accepted. I fully intended to be a theoretical condensed matter physicist. And I had done work on superconductivity for my bachelor's thesis at MIT, and one of the physicists whose work in the field most interested me, uh, Dr. Uh, John Robert Schrieffer, uh, was at Penn, and of course he, as you know, uh, shared the Nobel Prize for the BCS theory of superconductivity. But a strange, tragic coincidence sent me down a different path, because as I was leaving Penn after the visit in a car on the way to the Philadelphia airport, the radio broadcast came on and we learned that the Reverend Dr. King had been shot and later died. And so by the time I got back to Cambridge, I knew that I would remain at MIT for grad school. I was inspired by the courage of Dr. King and I felt that MIT was a place where I would have the greatest opportunity to change things uh, for the better. Of course, MIT was an excellent place to study physics. But in fact, it was not as active in condensed matter physics at that time. So I changed my focus to elementary particle physics. Now this sacrifice, if it was a sacrifice, was more than worthwhile given the important ways that I was able to influence MIT. And through MIT, our national community of scientists and engineers. Because a group of like-minded students, we called ourselves the Black Students Union, presented proposals to the MIT administration that would make MIT a much more welcoming place for minorities and ultimately women. And Associate Provost Paul Gray, who later became president of MIT and one of my best friends, listened, uh, formed a task force on educational opportunity and asked me to join it. That task force accomplished a great deal and MIT began for the first time actively to recruit minority students and faculty in significant numbers. It also initiated a six-week summer program called Project Interphase that helped to prepare incoming minority freshmen for the rigorous coursework they would encounter. But the program, in fact, was open to all who needed it. And though I was still a student, I was asked to design and teach in the physics curriculum. And the students I helped to bring to MIT and helped to adjust to its culture truly excelled, and they proved to the world that scientific and engineering talent is not restricted to one race, one sex, or one story of origin. So even as a graduate student, I was already operating at the nexus of physics and society. And because I had proven that I could do theoretical physics and address a complex challenge in a difficult social domain and find practical ways to address that challenge, I became an advisor to many organizations and in fact was offered many more opportunities for leadership. And indeed today I am a, a life member of the MIT Corporation, which is its board of trustees. After obtaining my PhD in elementary particle theory from MIT, I was fortunate to gain a postdoctoral position at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. And I had done numerical limit studies for my doctoral thesis which concerned the conversion of a multi-peripheral model for single particle inclusive interactions into a three-body problem using certain conservation laws. 
And while at Fermilab, I was actually able to develop an exact solution to the problem after understanding that certain kinds of symmetries inherent in the problem were Lie group relevant. But by welcoming scientists from all over the world, Fermilab was a catalyst for uh, great physics and for great friendships. And in my first year there, I had the privilege of getting to know a fellow theorist, Dr. Mary Kay Gaillard, who was visiting from CERN. And she persuaded me to spend the next year working with her uh, in Switzerland. And at CERN, I worked with Mary Kay on a paper on neutrinos and gained the invaluable perspective of uh, being abroad. Now, this was an exciting uh, moment in particle physics as the standard model was just crystallizing and, and new elementary particles were being discovered. In fact, I was at CERN when Dr. Sam Ting, who had a research group there, discovered the J psi particle, a discovery for which, as you know, he and Bert Richter, who also had discovered the particle independently at SLAC, would share the Nobel Prize. Now, after CERN, I returned to Fermilab to complete my second postdoctoral year. And I have to say, jobs were hard to come by in high energy physics, but in physics generally. But there were a few opportunities in my original field of interest, theoretical condensed matter physics, in industry as well as in academia. And I had attended as a graduate student a theoretical physics summer school at the University of Colorado Boulder. That's why I'm here today, by the way where I had met Dr. John Clauder, a theorist uh, at the great Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. He facilitated an introduction to the head of the theoretical physics department at Bell Labs. And so at an American Physical Society March meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, I met with uh, Dr. Morris Rice of Bell Labs, who invited me there to initially to give a talk in theoretical physics, but then a colloquium. And in my talk at Bell Labs, I, of course, described my work on neutrinos, but I also explained how I intended to apply my interests in the topological properties of solutions to nonlinear field theories to certain models of condensed matter systems. So I won a limited term appointment, essentially a glorified postdoc, and moved into condensed matter theory. A year later, after I had done some interesting work, IBM, offered me a job at the Watson Research Center. And Bell Labs quickly moved to make my position permanent. Now, they were going to do it anyway, I'm told, but they were going to wait a while. Now, this was a thrilling period in physics as well. And early in my time at Bell Labs, two of its scientists, uh, radio astronomers, Dr. Arno Penzias and Dr. Robert Wilson, were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the cosmic microwave uh, background radiation. Now at Bell Labs, uh, I developed theories which predicted the uh, presence of, in fact, topological formations in charge density waves in two-dimensional systems. And I modeled the optical and electronic properties of strain layer semiconductor materials. Because of this uh, research, I was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society and then later the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In fact, I subsequently served on the governing councils of this wonderful society and on the executive committee of the American Institute of Physics. But then two windows opened for me during my time at Bell Labs that set me down new paths and strongly drew me into public policy. Uh, first, I was asked to join the board of a natural gas company, New Jersey Resources, and for the first time, became engaged with energy policy. And as a result, I was a natural choice when a recruiter was looking for a new director for PSEG, or Public Service Enterprise Group, and that was the largest of the energy companies in New Jersey and one of the largest in the country. And PSEG owned or co-owned five nuclear reactors. Uh, because of my original background in elementary particle physics, I sat on and later chaired for a number of years the PSEG Nuclear Oversight Committee, visiting its nuclear plants often. And I'm telling you this because I'm hoping you begin to see the river that runs through it. Now, the second window was government service. I was asked by New Jersey Governor Tom Kane to join the New Jersey Commission 
on science and technology as a founding member. The commission was set up to create partnerships between industry and government through investment in disciplines uh, important to the New Jersey economy and to bring uh, higher education into it. And it invested in fields such as advanced biotechnology and medicine. Now this position was unpaid. I was uh, still working at Bell Labs, but it did require New Jersey State Senate confirmation because we were giving away state money. And it introduced me to a number of prominent business people and government leaders. Two governors subsequent to Governor Kane also tapped me for unpaid advisory roles, uh, also one of which was important enough to require state senate confirmation. And so I ended up working for Governor Tom Kane, uh, Governor uh, Christine uh, Todd Whitman, and Governor Jim Florio. And we always have in life both witting and unwitting mentors. And so I'm unsure how my name arose when President Bill Clinton was looking in 1994 for a commissioner for the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the US NRC, which, as you know, licenses, regulates, and safeguards vis-a-vis -vis nuclear materials, the use of nuclear reactors, nuclear materials, spent nuclear fuel, and nuclear waste. But given my scientific background, my government service in New Jersey, and familiarity with nuclear power plants from PSEG, I was ready for this leap, although I was a bit nervous. In fact, I had a moment of disbelief when the White House first called and asked me to send my resume to them for an unspecified position. I hesitated, but I did send it in. And after I interviewed for a spot as one of five commissioners, President Clinton offered me the job as chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, three years earlier, having missed teaching and advising students, I had switched from full-time to part-time at Bell Labs and had accepted a position at Rutgers University as a tenured full professor of physics. So I stepped away from a tenured academic position to take on this quasi-political role at the NRC, which required some temerity, but I felt it sat truly at the nexus of my background in physics and to that point, public policy. But suddenly I had responsibility for an organization that provided safety and nuclear non-proliferation oversight of a multi-hundred billion dollar set of enterprises at a time of growing public concerns about the safety of nuclear power, especially in the aftermath of the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the Ukraine in 1986, and I went to become chairman of the NRC in 1995. But the chairmanship of the NRC played into my strengths as an elementary particle physicist. I clearly understood the physics, the nuclear physics. I understood the technology and the associated public policy. And I could work through the complexities of the markets and geopolitical environments in which nuclear power and nuclear non-proliferation operated. And it's because of the succession of positions in the government, state government sector, my academic background, being on the board of the energy company, being involved with the APS. Now at that time, the NRC needed to reaffirm its fundamental uh, health and safety mission, enhance its regulatory effectiveness, and to position itself for change. So, we held public meetings and listened to community concerns, and I led the, de the development of a strategic plan for the NRC, its first ever. And this plan and the relating, related planning, budgeting, and performance management system I instituted actually put the NRC on a more business-like footing, and PBPM, as it is called, is still in use at the NRC today. We also put in place the first license renewal process to extend the operating life of nuclear reactors and introduced an approach to regulation uh, at the NRC that used probabilistic risk assessment, which was really originated um, uh, by Norm Rasmussen of MIT and used it on a consistent basis. And it even influenced 
the nuclear codes and standards of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and it informed the nuclear regulatory programs of other nations. And risk-informed regulation, as it was called, uh, still persists to this day. Now, my tenure as chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission occurred also not long after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Now, the forum heard from the 2016 Burton awardee, then Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, uh, and you heard him talk about efforts to bring to the United States 500 tons of high-enriched uranium left in uh, former Soviet satellites for disposition, actually, in fuel for U.S. commercial nuclear reactors. And that's an effort that ultimately faltered. But the uh, U.S. NRC was involved in that effort in that the licensing of the nuclear power plant fuel fell under the aegis of the uh, NRC. And the NRC also has a materials accounting responsibility uh, for the use of these materials in commercial reactors. Now, this was part of a larger effort uh, at the time to secure uh, the weapons-grade material of the nuclear programs of the Soviets, which occurred across the countries of the former Soviet Union. And so the NRC worked alongside the U.S. Department of Energy to create an MPCA regime, namely a nuclear materials protection, control, and accounting framework to track and to uh, gather and put under uh, physical protection and accounting uh, that nuclear material. Now, for the NRC, that also meant uh, spent nuclear fuel from Soviet-designed reactors. Now, there were other concerns in this period as well, because when it was discovered, what was discovered after the creation of the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union was that the design basis documentation of the commercial nuclear reactors of those countries lay with Russia, not, uh, what was, that was not left with the Soviet, the former Soviet uh, satellites. So they had no documentation uh, from, these, uh, from that period for these plants. So as chairman, I had the opportunity to have the NRC work with those countries to reconstruct the design basis of those plants in order to do probabilistic risk assessment to expose and to remediate as much as possible the greatest vulnerabilities of those reactors, such as the positive coefficient of reactivity of the RBMK reactors, which were the Russian reactors of the Chernobyl type. Much of this work was done as well under the aegis of the U.S.-Russian Federation Binational Commission, led by Vice President Al Gore on the U.S. side and Prime Minister Viktor Chernomyrdin uh, on our side. And as NRC chairman, I was a member of that commission and chaired its Nuclear Safety, commission, co nuclear safety Committee. And in that role, I uh, at, had the NRC help to write nuclear regulations and an overall nuclear framework and train nuclear safety inspectors uh, from the newly independent states. Interestingly, as well, my tenure as chairman of the USNRC began as apartheid in South Africa ended. As a member of the US South Africa Binational Commission, the so-called Gore and Becky Commission, I had the great privilege of advising Nelson Mandela's government on the development of a policy and programmatic framework for nuclear safety and of welcoming South African nuclear inspectors to the NRC for training. Now, in the wake of the catastrophic accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 1986, such a sharing of knowledge was clearly essential. And this was burned into my brain because one of the first trips abroad I took as chairman of the NRC was, in fact, to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Now, I just recently returned 
to South Africa, uh, where I was uh, privileged about a week ago to be awarded an honorary doctoral degree by Stellenbosch University, which, as you know, was at the heart of Afrikaner intellectual and policy thought and education during apartheid in South Africa. And when the first uh, black president or rector was named for Stellenbosch, he called me and asked me to be his mentor. Uh, and I did that for a while. And unfortunately, he passed away suddenly, prematurely. But we've had this linkage then with uh, South Africa. But to go back to my story, uh, after meeting early in my tenure at the NRC with my senior nuclear regulatory counterparts from around the world, under the aegis of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and the OECD, Nuclear Energy Agency, uh, we saw the need for even greater international cooperation to avoid disasters such as Chernobyl in the future. So in 1997, I spearheaded the formation of the International Nuclear Regulators Association, the INRA, as a high-level forum to assist nations uh, and to allow other nations to assist yet other nations in promoting nuclear safety and the best practices and principles for that. The initial membership comprised Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Spain, Sweden, the UK, and the US. And you see some of the members here. I was elected the first chairman of the group uh, in 1997 and served for two years. Uh, at the NRC, we also pushed for an international convention on nuclear safety, clearly needed in the aftermath of Chernobyl. And I have to say that initially, the United States Senate was hostile to this convention. And it took us a long time to get it ratified. But we did finally manage to do that. We initiated it, but we were essentially the last country to ratify it. But such communication and cooperation across borders has only grown more important in the intervening years. Because today, humanity's challenges are, urban, are urgent and global. They include, of course, climate change, uh, food, fresh water, and energy security for a growing uh, global population, national and global security overall, the mitigation of disease and human health, sustainable materials and infrastructure, and the intelligent use of the natural resources we have. But they include, as well, overcoming the most troubling aspects of our society's histories and ensuring equality of opportunity for all. Now, four years into my NRC tenure, another unforeseen opportunity arose and another decision. I was asked to continue at the NRC and to become the chairman again, but I was asked to assume the presidency of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute by its board of trustees. But having been educated at another great technological research university, MIT, I felt that I could help Rensselaer to grow in its global reach and impact because Rensselaer has had a rich history since 1824 of producing outstanding graduates who have designed and built much of the physical and digital infrastructure of the United States and around the world. One of my predecessors as president of Rensselaer was George Lowe, who in fact was the operations director and essentially uh, after that uh, horrific accident on the launch pad, uh, ran the Apollo program that put man on the moon. And remember, it was the space race and the change in the curriculum in math and science in the United States that was a key factor in my becoming a physicist in the first place. At Rensselaer, we focus in areas of research that we feel are of fundamental significance in the 21st century, including computational science and engineering, biotechnology and the life sciences, nanotechnology and advanced materials, energy, the environment, and smart systems, and media, the arts, science, and technology. And so we bring many disciplines to bear on the challenges, uh, 
undergirded by these five areas I mentioned. We call them signature research thrusts. And that's because the challenges are too complex to be confronted by any one person or discipline. And so we have a vision of the new polytechnic that fosters collaborations across field sectors, geographies, and generations, and enable those collaborations with the most advanced tools and technology. And we enlist those deliberately whose talents in the past have been overlooked, including women, uh, underrepresented minorities, and other underrepresented groups. And we have transformed the campus in Troy with state-of-the-art platforms that include our Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, the Curtis R. Prim Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, and the Center for Computational Innovations, which houses one of the most powerful supercomputers at a private uh, university in the US. But it is part of a strong computational ecosystem that includes faculty research and advanced tools in AI, data science, semantics, neuromorphic computing, quantum computing, and immersive technologies and hybrids of all kinds. In taking on the presidency of Rensselaer, I nonetheless have kept my fingers on the pulse of industry by serving on the boards of a number of major corporations, including IBM, FedEx, and Medtronic, and leading nonprofits and associations, including uh, the Smithsonian Institution, where I was vice chairman of the Board of Regents, and as vice chair, had the opportunity to speak uh, along with President Obama, former President uh, George uh, Bush, and with Congressman John Lewis. Uh, at the opening of the new National Museum of African American History and Culture. I've also, I'm now a Regent Emerita of the uh, Smithsonian. And I also uh, served the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where uh, I served successively as president and then chairman. But I've also maintained my commitment to policymaking uh, in science and in national security. In 2009, President Barack Obama appointed me to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAS, where I served for over five years. As a member of PCAS, I co-chaired with Eric Schmidt of Google a major study on advanced manufacturing, whose recommendations led to a number of important initiatives, including the development of the Manufacturing USA network that brings together industry, academia, and government partners for the development of foundational technologies. And again, one could say it's this coming full circle from what I started at the state level in New Jersey. And I'm pleased to say that uh, Rensselaer leads in three of these institutes focused on advanced robotics, biopharmaceuticals, and smart manufacturing. Now, when she was Speaker of the US House of Representatives for the first time, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi asked that I serve on the National Commission for the review of the research and development programs of the United States intelligence community. And that experience, among others, led President Barack Obama to ask me in 2014 to serve as co-chair of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, which assesses issues pertaining to the quality, quantity, and adequacy of intelligence activities an important role at a fraught time, given uh, what's been going on in the world, uh, given the rise of non-state actors, and of course, the uh, a threat of cyber attacks of many kinds. Now, in the intelligence community R&D review, and especially as co-chair of PIAB, as it is called, I advocated for stronger analytical approaches to the assessment of data, both structured and unstructured, from disparate data sources, work which links importantly to the work that researchers in physics do every day. In addition, I had the privilege of serving on the United States Department of State International Security Advisory Board uh, from 2011 to 2017, having been initially uh, appointed to that by Secretary Hillary Clinton, and then I remained on the board uh, with an appointment by Secretary John Curry. I also served on the U.S. Secretary of Energy Advisory Board between 2013 and 2017 
for Secretary Ernie Moniz, uh, where I had the privilege of co-chairing a study on the future of high-performance computing, including data-centric, neuromorphic, and quantum computing. So my work in science, technology, and public policy puts me in the middle of academia, industry, and government partnerships. It draws on my theoretical physics, my public policy, and my leadership background. As president of a technological research university and with my involvement in corporate boards, I'm able to stay at the forefront simultaneously of what is important in basic science and engineering, in public policy, in national and global economic vitality and security. In fact, uh, I chaired a global futures council for the World Economic Forum for two years on international security. In these myriad ways, I support exciting new discoveries and innovations, and the people doing it, importantly, while helping to solve global challenges, and I hope to uplift lives and while continuing to grow intellectually. And so it's been quite a career. I refer to it sometimes as my checkered career. But it has been quite a career for a theoretical elementary particle physicists. And it is one that I'm very grateful for. Although theoretical physics is considered by many to be one of the most abstract of all exercises of human intelligence, I would argue that it does indeed offer excellent training for leadership and work in public policy. Now, a number of other theoretical physicists have been drawn into policy-making roles, such as Dr. Ernest Moniz, who, as you know, uh, formerly the 13th United States Secretary of Energy, a brilliant policymaker and diplomat who had involvement that was crucial in shaping the Iran nuclear agreement. In spite of what has happened to that, that was a very significant milestone. And he is one to whom Rensselaer awarded an honorary doctoral degree two years ago. And of course, John, Dr. John Holdren, who was President Barack Obama's science advisor and director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, again with whom I had the great privilege of working, and to whom we will award an honorary doctoral degree at our 213th commencement next month. In fact, he'll be our commencement speaker. So when one considers the great challenges facing humanity, which again cannot be addressed without solutions rooted in physics and science more broadly, it is clear why the expertise of physicists has heretofore been regularly relied upon by policymakers. I've talked about the challenges before of climate change, food, water, energy security, overall national and global security, security in the cyber realm, sustainable infrastructure, health, and of course, uh, mitigating disease and working from the scale of the molecule to the scale of complex systems. So we need to get back to a reliance on science and public policy and a belief in the work of scientists. It is not merely domain expertise that explains why physicists find themselves becoming statesmen. Uh, as a physicist, one develops an ability to look at systems that seem to be chaotic, uh, not to impose order, but to figure out a way to understand their complexity. Physicists see beyond the individual phenomena and try to find the principles that are both explanatory and predictive. Uh, such a, an approach is invaluable to problems not merely measurable in light years or Planck lengths, but those of societal and global scale as well. And I try to encourage uh, younger scientists when I talk with them to perhaps deliberately to stray off the path every now and then and accept the role outside of pure science if it promises to offer a valuable new perspective and a greater context for their efforts. But irrespective of where one falls in the spectrum from remaining in fundamental research or having the kind of broad-based career I've had, 
the river that runs through it has always been physics. My father used to say to me, aim for the stars so that you can reach the treetops. And at any rate, you will get off the ground. In other words, if you do not aim high, you will not go far. And this holds true for us as individuals and for all of us as a species. The very highest aims of humanity are captured in the questions posed by physicists, and it remains more crucial than ever that we continue to reach for the stars, both in science and in society. So again, physics is the river that runs through it. And I thank you for sharing some of my thoughts and experiences with you today. And if you have any questions that I could answer, I'd be delighted to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, please. So surely that was a brilliant talk. Congratulations on the Burton Forum Thank you. Award and uh, on the amazing diverse accomplishments through, throughout your career and continuing. Um, I, was, I was struck, you know, throughout your talk, the, the groups and the photographs. One remark, so there are a lot of things that have been accomplished, but one remarkably persistent problem seems to be the demographics of the groups you find yourself in, um, which have not gotten much more female and have not gotten much more colored than they were decades ago. And I mean, this is a problem that we really ought to be able to make more progress in. And I would be quite interested in your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I've made the comment uh, that there are things that we have to do uh, at the university level, and that's a focus that I have with our recruitment, both of students. But we've given now more attention to recruitment of graduate students, because what would need to change to change the makeup of the groups that I'm talking about is to have more women uh, who are educated in physics and in science more broadly but who then can have the opportunity to make a choice to do a broader range of things. The same being true of underrepresented minorities. But one has to get them there. But we face a larger issue, which has to do with um, what happens at the very earliest educational levels. And that's why I actually spent the time. I, I actually am not a person who especially likes to talk about my life but it's intertwined with what I came to talk with you about. And I ended up where a very unique window in time opened, which was this convergence of the Brown v. Board of Education decision, which integrated the public schools, and I'm a public school product, and the Soviet launch of the Sputnik satellite, which at that point riveted the nation's attention on where we were uh, in science, and it really opened a window for those who were interested in and had some talents in these arenas. So I stepped through that window. But we're at a funny moment now where uh, education in the public school systems, particularly in poor areas, uh, you know, it's just really not very good. And so I think uh, there have to be efforts to kind of reach back and decide on some baseline of of what every child should learn and has the right to learn. And I'm one who, uh, who's often said, and that people don't expect it from me with a background in physics, to say that at some level, I don't need a kid to be on the internet early on. I need that child to be able to read, to write, to stand on his, his or her feet and articulate. I need them to be able to add, subtract, multiply, divide, no fractions, decimals, learn some algebra, trigonometry. Because if I then put them on a computer or a PDA, they're going to cruise the net in about 10 minutes. 
It's that fundamental piece. And I always say you can't carry someone else if you can't walk yourself. And the, the problems are slightly different because I think women get, uh, young women, get dissuaded at a critical kind of point, mainly around the middle school level, from pursuing uh, their interests in, in building out their abilities uh, in science and math. Many minorities don't get to that point because of the education. But there are also people of other races who grow up in very poor areas who end up in a similar situation. And so what we really have to do is to have those of us who've had the opportunity to work at the highest levels to talk about what we do at the most fundamental levels. But it's a very difficult environment today to do that. So in terms of the energy mix in the United States, um, we're moving towards more renewables, which I think is a positive development. Um, and a number of states, for example, have set ambitious offshore wind targets, including New York and, and New Jersey. But it'll be um, some time before we get the hardware up and running and before we get the grid ready to right. handle all these um, uh, renewable um, sources. And at the same time, um, it's sort of I've observed that there's this difference of opinion about nuclear energy's role in uh, both current and future role in the energy mix. Um, for example, um, California is shutting down their nuclear power plants, whereas Illinois and New York have passed state legislation to save their existing nuclear plants. So I wonder if you could kind of share your opinion on nuclear's role, both in terms of kind of existing power plants and extending licenses and such, and then in, into the future? Well, I believe that nuclear has a role and, and should be part of the mix. It would be uh, good if we could get to some of the newer technologies in the new nuclear arena, but it's very hard to get companies to take the risk to invest. Now, you know there are certain efforts that are being backed by people like Bill Gates and so on uh, in that arena. But here's the thing that I think, uh, and, and this is the way I think from a public policy perspective. Different people and different groups have different types of energy sources they advocate for. And what I always try to do is to talk about a broad picture about what energy security means. And by definition, that requires one to think about redundancy of supply and diversity of source, to think about source for sector of use, to think about full life cycle costs from cradle to grave, and, and what has to happen to make that assessment and then to build in a framework. And then, frankly, it's a um, societal decision. Uh, many com countries that themselves uh, have nuclear programs, they do it because they want to have nuclear capability for broader things than just power generation. So that creates this fraught framework against which nuclear power is always evaluated. And then the support for nuclear tends to be broad in certain areas, but about an inch deep. So all it takes is one Chernobyl, even though it was, a, was not a nuclear criticality event, by the way, or it takes a Fukushima because the nuclear plants shut down the way they should have. It's just you had intersecting, what I call intersecting vulnerabilities with cascading consequences. And so it's hard to have those discussions, but we have to keep trying to do them. And it may sound like that's too pie in the sky, but that's the way I operated the NRC. That's why I pushed risk-informed, performance-based regulation using PRA, because then it wouldn't become just somebody's judgment. It at least let you look at relative risks to think about ways to strengthen the safety envelope. But I also understand, because I sit today on the board of PSEG, um, the overall 
regional and economic framework within which any power source has to operate. But that's all about generation. If you want a true energy security discussion, you have to talk as well about use. And so there's a huge use that comes with the built environment, uh, buildings themselves and transportation systems. And so we don't have that integrated discussion. And you heard me in my uh, remarks talk about sustainable infrastructure and materials. And so if one wants to think about lessening demand, there's a, the behavioral piece of getting people to change what they do. But we have to design our built environment differently and with different materials. That's also where I happen to think physics comes into play. So thank you very much for thank the presentation and, and your reflections on your career. Uh, one point that I was curious about, since it, it resonated closely with my own life, is choosing forks in the road. Yes. And particularly forks in the road that you don't typically hear in the halls of graduate departments uh, across the country or even across the world. So I'd like to hear more about the, the thought process uh, and some of the courage or even uh, support that you received in choosing uh, interesting forks and diversions in the road? Well, I always grew up believing and I was taught that uh, if I had talent and I had an opportunity and I certainly had a good education, that it was not enough for just me to succeed for me, but to try to do something for someone else. So. I've always kind of been doing that in terms of doing volunteer work at Boston City Hospital when I was at MIT and tutoring at the Roxbury Y. But look, the whole opportunity for me to be a physicist came because of societal upheaval and change. So my very career is linked to this nexus of science and society. And so I probably was more attuned to that than most people. I felt it was very important early in my career to do research and to do as well as I could and to make contributions. And so I did spend the first 18 years of my career essentially just doing that, 15 of them at Bell Labs full time. But as I went along, there. Uh, first, I decided I wanted to educate other young people in science, and that's why I became a professor. But in addition, these opportunities came along, and I would always reflect on, is there something more I could be doing? And I felt it was important to have credibility as a physicist, but then that I could go off and do these other things. I don't know that I was so brave. Maybe the bravest thing, believe it or not, was choosing to give up tenure to go to the NRC. But having done that, because many people's careers, when they've had presidential appointments, they're very high level, they're very prestigious. But if something goes wrong, your career is toast. So, but here I am. Please, let me hear. I'm uh, interested to hear um, how you've seen science policy be affected by administration changes. About? By administration changes, like historically and <laughs> I guess also the most recent right. <laughs> administration change. Well, I think this current uh, environment's one of the most uh, challenging uh, for science and support of, of basic science that, that I've seen in, in my career. You know, I think the... Um, the country owed a debt to science coming out of uh, World War II, uh, not just because of the, the uh, advent of the atomic bomb, but because of the fact that most people don't understand a lot of advances that were made uh, by science and physicists in particular. And that is what laid the basis uh, for Vannevar Bush's compact that he laid out uh, that uh, created and articulated this linkage of universities and government and universities, government and industry. 
And that's lasted for a long time. But I think the scientific community uh, has got to reach out more uh, because we kind of we can talk to each other. Um, the one thing I enjoyed about working with John Holdren is that one uh, study we did uh, had to do with K through 12 uh, STEM education because he and PCAS rec recognized that um, we needed to kind of uh, reach, uh, reach into that level in our uh, society. Um, so, so I am, have no ability to give a great prediction about uh, where uh, things will come out, but I do believe ultimately in something that President Obama always said, and then namely that the arc of history will bend toward justice. And so the pendulum is swinging pretty wildly right now, but I have to believe that it's gonna come back. And it's partly because a lot of the things that even those who think they don't want to support universities or don't understand basic science, that the things they want in their lives and in the economy and so on really do depend upon our continued progress. And then uh, humankind has this natural interest in who are we, the universe, what's out there, and, and so I think the pendulum will come back. But as my husband and I say, you gotta just live through it, but you gotta keep pushing and, and not be afraid. Please. I was interested in your comment that the Brown versus Board of Education decision had a direct and seemingly immediate effect on your education opportunities. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? What, sure. might, have, what might your education and opportunities have been had that decision not been made? Well, it's always hard to, to know what one's life would have been like for the path not taken. But I certainly know uh, what effect it had for my, my parents. Uh, my mother did go to college, in fact, had a graduate education. They, my parents were born in 1915, and my mother lived to be 100, so she, she saw a lot. Um, and for her time, she accomplished a lot, but she certainly didn't have all the opportunities that one would expect for her level of education. My father was brilliant, but his father had passed away when he was very young, and so he went to work early. So he never finished high school. He did get a Bronze Star because he did this very clever splice to fix these uh, rudder cables. Um, but my father was a postal worker, and he drove a taxi at night, and and he um, he in fact. Uh, worked in the post office all day and drove the taxi all night. And he devoted the taxi earnings to my, his contribution to my going to MIT. And my mother worked, and she didn't when we were very young, but she did later, and she devoted her earnings to uh, paying for my younger sister to go to the University of Michigan. And then I have an, an older sister who has a doctorate in education. My younger sister is a lawyer. Uh, I had a brother who passed away pretty young, but all of us are pretty well educated. And so first my parents uh, were critical. And so I would believe that there are things we would have done anyway because of who our parents were and how we were raised. But the Brown versus Board of Education decision changed the public schools in Washington, D.C. almost immediately. The decision was in 54, the schools were integrated in 55. And what happened was that when that happened, they went around the country and looked for teachers who they thought could teach in this integrated environment, meaning African-American teachers. And uh, as a consequence, I probably was fortunate enough to have some of the best teachers who themselves were extremely well-educated, but because of their ages and who they were, they were uh, high school and middle school, what we call middle school or junior high school teachers, and not necessarily working in labs. Remember the hidden figures, they were women who did things, and African-American women like uh, Katherine Johnson who did amazing things, but you didn't know about them. And so I had a math teacher who was like that, I had a Latin teacher. I studied Latin for six years. And I had the same math teacher all the way through high school. Um, 
And, you know, I had an economics teacher whose husband was a dean at Howard University. In fact, she tried to convince me to go to Howard instead of uh, MIT. And so one has, again, what I call witting and unwitting mentors. And it was, we, I went to school at a time, I'm old enough, where there, were, uh, there was a high school uh, assistant principal for girls and a high school assistant principal for boys. And the high school assistant principal for girls thought I was being too big for my britches as a woman, uh, thinking about going to MIT. The high school assistant principal for boys, who was a male, was the one who encouraged me to go to MIT. So you don't know which way uh, the window will open. But, be, but I have my own personality, and my parents were such that if an opportunity presented itself, I was going to do that. The other is that there was, because of this interest in science and math and getting people into that, uh, companies would be supporting people. And at that point, the, the, the then Martin Marietta Corporation, which is now part of Lockheed Martin, gave four-year scholarships to students from the Washington, D.C. area, one to a student from the Maryland suburbs, one from the Virginia suburbs, and one from Washington, D.C. And so I actually was nominated and had to go off to Baltimore to meet with this long table of white males. <laughs> and, and I got the Washington, D.C. scholarship. And it turns out that the guys, there were two men, two white males, who got the scholarships from the Virginia suburb and the Maryland suburb, all of us went to MIT. And one majored in double E, one in math, and I in physics. So it's an interesting story. So that gives you a little more color. So thank you.